Well, good evening and welcome to Rethinking Faith. I'm Mitch, one of the hosts uh, again tonight, if you didn't already know, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. James Ballard there, and then also Mr. Ray Luke there, and we're excited that you guys have tuned back in to another episode, and yeah. Rethinking Faith is beginning to stir the waters a little bit, and we're excited about it, but in a good way, and the good way is, is that we, again, I mentioned this on the last episode, I want to thank those of you that are out there that are now participating um, that participation has been a big dream of ours and a big prayer and participating in questioning and, and dialoguing with us back and forth has been amazing. So we really appreciate you uh, jumping in like that tonight. I think you're going to enjoy this episode. We're going to look at something that <clears throat> I'm not going to try to put words into anyone else's mouth that, you know, everybody else that's here with me, but I know that um when I began this journey of uh, toward Judaism and began to shift away from Christian theology, there was also there were two things, there were two questions that I struggled with uh, actually while I was still within the Christian theological mindset. And these questions um, are very, very important when it comes to understanding Jesus or Yeshua. And they, they play a, an important part in the foundation of how you view him, of how he is brought out within the, the, his, his teachings, within how he's described within the Gospels and so on. Yeah. And I think most Christians, many Christians at some point will begin to think about this when they start hearing the fact that Jesus is Jewish, okay? He's not from the West Coast of America. He's not from the Bible Belt in the Southeast here. He is Jewish. And with that comes what comes with being Jewish. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm part Polish, and with that comes my Polish jokes, okay? So it's kind of like what it is, all right? <laughs> but being Jewish brings, brings a faith, and it brings what the foundation of Jesus is all about. The questions, and I'm going to throw these two questions up, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this up to Mr. James tonight and let him get started with us. I think you're going to enjoy this episode, and I hope that uh, we hear some kickback from you guys and some questions on it. The, the first one, the, the question was that, you know, it's like, why, why don't Jews need Jesus, Okay. Why do they not need Yeshua? The second question was, why don't Jews accept Jesus as the Messiah? Because the concept of Messiah did not come out of Liberty University up in Virginia. It didn't come out of, you know, some obscure place, you know, in a seminary. It is a Jewish concept. It is a Jewish concept with a Jewish meaning, with a Jewish uh focal point within the Torah and within scripture. Okay. So with that, you have to, you have to have a, a legit starting point and not a starting point beyond scriptures. And unfortunately within the Christian world today, the term Messiah uh, does, it has multiple, multiple definitions, multiple connotations, multiple thoughts that go with it. Yeah. So, you know, again, why don't, Jews need Jesus for that golden ticket, or why don't Jews accept Yeshua or Jesus as the Messiah? And we're going to focus heavily in on the Messiah part of it and begin to break that down a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this thing right over to you, Mr. James, <laughs> and you guys be prepared. I hope you got you a cup of coffee. I hope you're back comfortable and ready to rock and roll because here we go. All right, James, we, you know what? We need to get cups made. You know that? We need to get cups made with Ray's picture on it. 
<laughs> yes, and uh, rethinking. F okay. Anyway, <laughs> we're gonna roll this up to James, man. We should call it Ray Thinking Faith. Ray Thinking. Come on, man. <laughs> I think yeah. that's the actual image too on the um. Isn't it Ray YouTube? Thinking it's Ray Thinking. <laughs> ah, awesome, I, I, I didn't. I didn't do that, man. <laughs> and I swear, if you cut this out of the actual recording, I'll never do another one with you. All right. So it better stay in there, man. All right. No, I, I, I didn't touch it. But, but what all do right, you think, so, James? So these questions are very deep. I think some. Someone, I'll just I'll just throw down a disclaimer now. Um, these are our these are, are beginning to touch the bundle of nerves that a lot of people just don't want to talk about <clears throat> or are not prepared to talk about because humans have a, a a it's an aversion to new information and something that challenges the very core of your beliefs. Um, we I think the three of us have all gone through and I think a lot of our listeners have too. Hence, some of the questions we're starting to see now in private messages and in email and on the, on the comments. Many of us have gone through a journey where we've probably killed all the sacred cows and we had to start over and figure out which ones are legit and which ones mm -hmm. had to go. Yeah. For someone who hasn't been through that journey yet, it's a very painful, scary, um, but, but worthwhile journey. So for, for someone like that, I think we're probably going to trigger them. Um, I think just hang out, stick with it. I think we'll come back around to it. I would say we're going to answer them in reverse because what the first one was, is why don't they need? So we'll come back to that. Why don't Jews need Yeshua, Jesus? Um, but the one I want to answer now briefly, and then we can jump into that other one because it's a much more interesting concept. It probably hasn't been spoken about very much is why don't they accept? So we'll get the why, why don't they accept out of the way first, and then we'll get to the other ones. Sounds um, good. Historically, we covered this in one of our episodes in the past, anti-Semitism in the early church. Mm -hmm. From yep. very early on, even it's even in the New Testament, Paul is trying to course correct in the case of Romans, the, the already uh, divergent Gentile perspective in Movements. the synagogue. Yep. Right. And it was already becoming anti-Jewish. And Paul gives an amazing treatise in the later um, 10, 11, and 12, kind of explaining the need for Israel and, and the, the need to be very humble because they're the natural branches, right? And he says a lot of beautiful things of which we'll talk about. But from very early on, even in the New Testament, um, the Gentile, the predominantly Greek Roman cultures, which had a long history of being anti-Jewish to some extent, think about um, the Maccabean revolt, when the Jews were out of the community, they, they continued to move away at very quick paces and mm. new ideas became um, popular. And all those mm. gaps where the oral tradition and, and good sound kosher Torah explanations of these deep, deep concepts like Messiah, Messiah, the concept of Messiah is so deep. I don't think you can ever really hit the bottom of it. And we'll talk about again, why, if you stick with us here, um, but it's been oversimplified and even in some cases merged with Hellenistic ideas. And then yeah. because there's this emphasis from the church, you have to witness and convert everyone to Christianity. Um, the church has a hard time understanding what exactly the New Testament is saying, which is why there's so many denominations. And many of them are just quite honestly anti-Jewish uh, or they're anti um, the message of the Torah. Yes. So, just on the theological principle alone, Jews have a lot of problems with certain concepts, like um, the way the deification of Jesus has been presented, um, the, the position of the Torah. Anyone, you know, the Torah says, if someone says, abandon the commandments of God, don't listen to them, right? Many times you see this out throughout the Tanakh. And that's quite honestly what the church has done for most of its history. So yeah. historically, theologically, Crusades, blood libels, um, all of these things have really just shattered any chance of there being neutral ground for the message, for conversation to even happen, because a lot yeah. of that bad blood is blamed on Jesus, who many people are now realizing, oh, wait, he was an Orthodox Jew. Oh, wait, this changes things. And okay. I, I know of Orthodox Jews who say, oh, he's, it's not Jesus. Nobody has a problem with him. Right. So they've shifted. It's it's the religion that came from him or it's Paul. Right. Like it's kind of moved downstream a little bit. That's a big step. 
from where we've been in the past. So mm -hmm. I think historically, theologically, it's very simple to see there are, there are huge chasms between Jewish explanation of the, the themes and what Messiah means and the Jewish, I'm sorry, the Christian version of what Jesus is. And that's, that's what we're going to dive into. But mm -hmm. right out of the gate, um, by the first century, these things are already off the rails and it's only yep. continued into our day. So that's, that's why most Jews, quite honestly, even those who aren't very versed in the Jewish version of what Messiah or the Messiahs even mean, um, hmm. they also, right, like there's a high level, they know that Jesus isn't the Messiah because they look at the world around them and say, yeah, the world hasn't been rectified. So he can't be the Messiah, right? But there's, there's a lot of room to put these back on the table and information that's now available to us so we can dive in and understand these from a little more nuanced perspective. It's neither here nor here. It's it's in the middle. And I think both yeah. groups have to kind of let go of the, the the positions they hold and be a little bit more open to discussing. And I think that's why this page that's is great. Also. Great word, James. Yeah. Great word. Before Ray, before you jump in, James, let me ask you a question real quick. Um the explosiveness of when it took off what why do you what do you think drove that explosiveness for it to go that you know whether you call it the split or whether you call it um uh, because a, a lot of christians when they think about the separation uh, you know whether they term it you know old new um two christians uh, we're good you're not anymore however that's done when it when it began to to separate like that it went like like a wooden house on fire okay what do you think just real quickly there what do you think caused that ignition to just go so quickly um within within a culture where you know it was all brand new so I, this is one thing i, I want to do throughout this episode i want to look at these on different levels Okay. We should always look at everything historically and in the Torah and wherever in different levels. Historically, yeah. I think the values of the Jewish system, the way of life, were very attractive. People were getting kind of fed up with the Roman Empire and, and the way that the emperors were running. Quite mm. honestly, they were, you know, Caligula and some of these other just <clears throat> awful people were, were at the level of deity. And it was very obvious that they were doing things that were not for the people. And I think historians seem to find evidence that Gentiles just found the way of life, especially women. They found the way of life, the, um, the way women were treated and such in the Jewish worldview, very favorable. Yeah. Uh, on a spiritual level, honestly, Hashem. Hashem yeah. This is that, that divine providence we spoke about in one of our episodes a few back. If, and Ray, we were talking about this, if Yeshua had remained an obscure rabbi within the Jewish world, he would be like every other obscure Jewish rabbi that nobody else knows um, that we read yeah. about in the Talmud. You wouldn't even know he, he existed. He, nobody would even know he existed. But because of the way... The nations. The nations yeah. would never have known. Yeah, nobody would. Like, right. And so I think, and I think a lot of Jews too, because when you look at the way history went, True. a lot of us True. Came, came back to Judaism through Christianity because yeah. it's more widespread than Judaism ever has been at this point. Yep. Yeah. So True. on one level, historical, cultural, ethical. On another level, um, spiritual, it's Hashem. Quite honestly, I think all of these can be divided up like that. And at the end of all of it, you'll see God had a hand in all of it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, J uh, well, Ray, you know what? Since we're renaming this Ray Thinking Faith, <laughs> we're going to come to you now. So what do you think, buddy? Um, man, um, so, you know, covering the historical aspect of it, as James was saying, I mean, Christians, Messianics, people who do not even affiliate, don't, don't have a, a name that they, they connect with, whatever. But if you're a believer in Yeshua, we have to understand how much responsibility there is in that. And we need to begin to start taking Yeshua's, Jesus's teachings, uh, take them seriously and, and, and apply them practically in our lives. Yeshua said, he taught, uh, I leave you a commandment, 
uh, which is not a new commandment, to love one another, he says. And by this, you'll be known as my disciples, that you love one another as I have loved you. Mm-hmm. Imagine that. Imagine if that virtue, if that nida, that, uh, that characteristic trait of love for from a Gentile to his fellow countrymen, the Jews, if that was instead shown to the Jewish people and not what we know throughout history. Imagine the relationship that we would have now. I honestly, mm. honestly think that we probably would be in another world right now. We would probably be in the Messianic era right now mm. if that was the case. I wow. honestly believe that with all my heart. Um, there's so many other things that Christians, Messianics would do well if they would just you know, take seriously the teachings that Yeshua has laid down. Um, he's he's known as a Torah in the flesh, meaning that you can learn from him from just every little thing that he does because uh, he was consistently uh, in his life uh, showing how uh, to observe the will of God. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> that's just as a starting point to say, now, when we talk about this, about this is a very difficult question. I remember when I, when I, when I heard uh, one the listener who brought it down, he asked, this is a fair, honest question. The Jewish people know so much, and, and we have talked, Mitch, James, we have talked about this. As <clears throat> I've learned more about the concept of the Messiah and about, about Yeshua as my Rebbe. I, uh, to understand his teachings historically and religiously within their context, I've learned it from Orthodox Jews. Mm-hmm. I've learned it from the rabbis not from Christianity, it never made any sense. Um, it was something that was ripped out of its context. And when these pieces of this puzzle began to be connected, I mean, I was just shocked. I had, I had no idea. Um, and so w- we need to get back to that. Historically, the concept of the Messiah, you know, how is it that the Jews don't accept him as Messiah? They know so much. They would know this, right? This is the question. And it's not that simple. And as we just covered the historical aspect, you can't just push that away with the finger. Uh, we couldn't even push it away with the entire sun. There's no way of pushing that away. There's been too much blood on our hands and we have to say our hands. And we have to start taking uh, responsibility for this stuff. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways of taking responsibility for this stuff is to acting upon it. What we're doing, we're learning and we're returning, doing tshuva, returning back to the proper path of God, the proper path that Jesus and the apostle walked is the same. It's the same path that the prophets walked. It's the same path that Moses walked. Mm-hmm. But Christians and in all the branches of Christianity that has come after it has gone mm-hmm. on a detour way, has gone a different way. Um, so the first thing I would say about this historically is what is the concept of the Messiah and, and, and who knows what the Messiah is supposed to be and what is he supposed to do? <clears throat> you have to be looked at at the very least as a messianic candidate. If you can be in the, if you could be within the running of a messianic candidate, which many messiahs have been, then we could see what, what are the baselines to know who is going to be the Messiah? I mean, there's plenty of rabbis who have done it. Remember, the concept comes from Judaism. Um, so things like he would have to be a Torah scholar. Okay, he would, he would have to know the law of Moses at the back of his head. He would have to know it. Okay, He would have to be a descendant of David. He would have to be from that royal line of King David. Uh, and, it, and it stems through the father. Tribal affiliation comes through the father. There's a blunder there. There's a little problem there when we think about the New Testament. And it all depends on your theology. We've covered this in other segments too. No need to cover it again. Um, he has to be a descendant of David. Um, he would have to do certain uh, missions that the Messiah will carry out, fight the wars of God. Uh, the temple will have to be rebuilt at some point during his reign or after or some point. The exiles, the Jewish exiles will have to come back to the land. You know, the rabbis, these things are not as clear, but these are some of the things. And if peace comes to the world, to the Jews and to the world, then we know for certain that he is the Messiah, right? Mm -hmm. And here comes our problem. 
Guys, we are believers and sons of believers, just as much as a Breslover is a, is a believer in Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, or there are Chabadniks who believe that the Rabbi, Rabbi Schneerson of Chabad, holy tzaddik, a righteous man, um, they believe that he is the Messiah. But the problem is, is that they're all believers, and they all have their own merit and their own claim to him being the Messiah. The only problem is, is that where is the final evidence of that? Where is peace for Israel, and where is peace on earth? Where's the Messianic era? It's not to be found. I know Christians will say, well, he died for the sins of the world. He died for my sins, and you and they believe that, and they do well to believe that, and <clears throat> and he fulfilled messianic prophecies. <clears throat> Excuse me, and he died, and God raised him from the dead. There's nothing wrong with that. We there are people who believe that. We could believe that, but that is not a proof that I can tell a Jew or anyone, hey, this is why he's the Messiah. I mean, that's cool if you believe it for, for myself or for other people who believe it, but it doesn't prove that he's the Messiah, guys. It's been 2,000 years. It's yeah. been 2,000 years, and yeah. things have only gotten worse. There have only been more wars, and think about the, the, the history of those who carry, carry the Jesus banner, what they have done to the Jewish people. He's, he's so far away as being anything like a Messiah to the Jews. He has to be the Messiah to the Jews first. The Messiah must be the Messiah to the Jews first. If anything, it would have to make sense to them, right? There's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different concepts. And I believe um, the subject of the Messiah and the redemption is a very important subject. There's this book uh, called the Cephas Emes. Um, and it talks there and it says this, something very important. Okay, and I want you guys to understand this. The revelation of the Messiah, who will be the Messiah, and the actual redemption are two separate issues. And we've never looked at it this way, including many people within Judaism. They always think that the two are connected. In a sense, they are. But the revelation of who will be the Messiah doesn't mean, because remember, this, this rolls with a pattern, like Moses. When Moses revealed himself, did the redemption come? No, it did not. It did not. Actually, things got worse. The exile got harsher. Things got worse. So people equate the revelation of the Messiah with the redemption happening right away. It's not that way. One thing is the revelation of the Messiah, and another thing is the redemption. Okay? And it could, it could, it could take some time. There, there are arguments between the rabbis that... From the moment he reveals himself, how long would it take to the redemption? And they say, some say this amount of years. You say this amount of years. No one really knows. Yeshua himself said, of that day and hour, no one knows. Not the angels. No one but the Father. No one but God knows. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So now, the subject of the Messiah and the redemption is a very important subject. But there is a whole lot of confusion and lack of knowledge. Even many scholars who are knowledgeable in other areas of Torah are nevertheless ignorant in matters of the Messiah and redemption. Many have thoughts and feelings which stem from an emotional standpoint or hearsay. The norm is preconceived ideas, personal opinions, and guesswork. But what does the Torah sources say about the Messiah? When people ask, is this according to Judaism? The answer is that the definition of Judaism is that which is written in the Torah. And when we say the Torah, we say the written and the oral, they're interconnected. So I'm going to read to you a couple of passages here, guys, that I'm pretty sure our listeners probably have never ever heard of when we're talking about, well, it's so clear that the Messiah is supposed to do this and it's going to be clear to all. It's not that simple. Let me read a few passages. This is from the rabbis themselves. Rabbi Yehuda Chayon in Otsuros Achares Hayamin, okay? The book is called When Mashiach Comes. In page 119, it says like this. If the Jews merit the redemption, they will immediately recognize Messiah by his signs and wonders. If they are unworthy, however, his authenticity will be questioned. Hmm. Wow. Jesus said himself, he said, he said, there was a point. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, those who kill the prophets were sent to them. How long have I wanted to gather you as a hen who gather her chicks, but you were unwilling, meaning they did not merit the redemption. 
but you were unwilling. Okay? He says that. It's really interesting that he says that. Another passage from the Scroll of Secrets. This is a book by Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, very ancient secret scroll, and page 16. It says this. It says, they will not know at first that he is the one. Afterwards, each will reach his own conclusion and will consider that it is possible that this is him. Happy will be the stronger faith in those days. And my last quote is from a disciple of Rabbi Nachman, or it's written by one of the disciples of Rabbi Nachman, but it's Rabbi Nachman's teachings. And uh, it's from his stories on page 382. It says like this. And when the Mashiach first appears, he will not be accepted by all. Many will cast doubts upon him because he won't be what they expected. Some will deride him and say that he's deranged, all because it's not the way they would have arranged. And I know a lot of Christians and Messianics are licking their chops listening to some of these, some of these uh, quotes because it seems as if it's talking about Jesus, right? But I would say this. Uh, most Christians and Messianics, a lot of them, have shot themselves on the foot uh, from the jump because they say when Jesus came, uh, the animal sacrifices were done away with, meaning the Torah was done away with. He, he doesn't do all that tradition stuff. He came to put that stuff away. And, and the law, that's done away with too. And um, though Jesus himself always pointed to the Father, to God, he said, my God and your God, right? Talking to his fellow disciples, yeah. they have made him into an idol. Uh, something that Jews cannot even look to. They cannot even pronounce his name because he is so uh, intertwined and connected to our fault uh, with idolatry. Yeah. Um, this is a huge problem. Mm. So those sources are Jewish sources. They, they're unconnected with Jesus. But it's very interesting that for us who follow the historical religious path of the historical Jesus, this makes a lot of sense to us. But it's nothing that we could spear anyone with because, again, we are believers. Where's, where's the evidence that he is the Messiah? I mean, he can be the Messiah for me. I can believe that with all my heart. As much as a breast lover believes it or as much as someone else may believe it, they're Rebbe, Right? But we're going to talk about another aspect, which is more mystical. The New Testament is very mystical, uh, oh, whether you yes. guys know it or not. But we're going to talk about another aspect of this, which is very interconnected, about what has transpired. Why did these things happen in the, in the way that it happened? James? Hmm. Yeah, I, and one, one thing <clears throat> is to add a little more um, color to everything you're saying, which is great. Historically, scholars <clears throat> have not been allowed to really dive into these questions. Right. Yeah. This mm -hmm. for much of the past two thousand years, excommunication, death. There, yep. right, you couldn't yep. you couldn't challenge the church and their their doctrine. So we're, we've entered a phase, seventeen um, hundreds probably onward, maybe maybe around that time, that you can start asking these questions. And it takes a while for knowledge, scholar, scholastic, academic <clears throat> knowledge, to make its way into tradition. Right. In some yep. cases, it doesn't make its way in at all. Um, in our time, we have new writings available. And, uh, you know, all of that to say, there's always this oral tradition in Judaism. And this is one of the problems I have with leaning solely on academics is, is the entire corpus of material where you would understand the Messiah tradition is not usually written. It's mm. an oral tradition. And I'm going to hold up a book here, um, one that I recommend everyone get. It's called... Kol Hator, uh, the voice of the turtle dove. It's by the, the Vilna Gaon, or a student of the Vilna Gaon. And it only emerged in like the last maybe 100 years in English yep. or some kind of translation. Yep. And it's really one of the best writings on Mashiach ben Yosef. Wow. And this is what I find to be the biggest problem today. When mainstream people talk about Messiah, they tend to think Mashiach ben, De ben David, son of David. That's the one who brings in the redemption. They don't know about the, the split, the, the two messiahs. Mashiach ben Yosef comes first and, and does a lot of groundwork. He's only mentioned very briefly in the rabbinic literature, I think maybe once or twice in the entire 
Talman, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. I, I can think of one specifically. Um, there's really not a lot of mention of it because it's a veiled concept, concealment. Yep. Judaism is not a religion like Christianity where everything is concealed and everyone can learn everything. That's never how it's been. Even Yeshua partitioned what he would teach the very people in front of him. He would yep. teach some people a very high level thing, knowing they wouldn't understand it. And when his apostles would ask, why didn't you, why don't you know, why don't you teach them? It's like, they're not ready for it. You've been given the kingdom, the keys of the yeah. kingdom. They the have secrets, not. Yeah. Right. So Judaism is not a religion of just open source, everything's out there available for you. Right. And in fact, I would say a lot of Jews, a lot of Orthodox Jews would be probably a little bit, a little frustrated that we're talking about such high level concepts, such deep mystical concepts on YouTube. Um, we're not the only ones. There's other people out there doing it too, but that's just not how it's done in the Jewish world. Um, so the Kol HaTor really deep dives into the tradition. It's the only one I know of that talks about Mashiach ben Yosef, the one whose period starts around the first century and is about a 2,000-year window. And it's not just a person. It's a movement. Science yep. is in the aspect, in the spirit of Mashiach ben Yosef. Certain yep. people who aren't even candidates for Mashiach ben David are in the, the movement or an aspect of Mashiach ben Yosef. And I, I find the New Testament goes to great lengths to tell the story of Yeshua as Mashiach ben Yosef. His, yep. his father's name is Yosef. We've been through this on an episode before. Um, yep. It models a lot of the stories in the Midrash about Joseph. Very, very deep in, in is the New Testament in explaining Yeshua as Mashiach ben Yosef. Now, yep. when a Christian says, Jesus is Messiah. They don't know about Mashiach ben Yosef. And uh, most Jews who hear that, they look at the world and say, well, the redemption hasn't come in, so he can't be Mashiach ben David. We're talking like this. We're talking two yes. different roles, yes. two different times, two different job descriptions. Yep. And I think if, if both groups came back to the table, we would see that there's a world of information in here that the New Testament has not been allowed, has not been presented well. Which, like you said, Ray, is the the um, Mashiach ben Yosef movement is concealed to prepare the world for the redemption. It doesn't just happen all at once like that. The yes. world is not ready. Yes. As evidenced by the fact right. that we're still not ready. But things are moving in a direction, and that's why we're here. and We can talk about these concepts. That's why books like <clears throat> Kol HaTor exist today, because we're getting close to that end. The end of the period of Mashiach ben Yosef. So then the argument becomes, well, who is Mashiach ben David? Right? That's, that is what the, the argument then becomes. I think that is still up for debate. You can believe yep. who you want to believe is Mashiach ben, ben David. But the reality is when, when the moment happens, how will you know if it's your guy or someone else? Right? It's kind of a, exactly. it's a very strange, it, it, it's good to have beliefs but it's so nuanced in the jewish world it's not so simple anymore when you mm. say um when you know there's two messiahs and one does this job one does that one you have to be very specific when you say you believe certain person is messiah which messiah yeah. and what's your evidence <clears throat> for that claim let me, let me say something real quick too <clears throat> where you know james you brought to the table the uh the the thoughts of two messiahs and you know Shiaks and the roles that they play. This is this is such foreign language uh, under the 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 steeple, and it's. And by the way, for Christians that are listening that are hearing the terms Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, uh, that simply means the Messiah son of Joseph or the Messiah son of David. Yep. Um, and it's very important that you understand that, that when you hear that, it, it, it's crucial you understand, number one, what it means, but number two, how they play out. Yep. For, for me, I know when I first began uh, hearing Ray talk about it and hearing it, you know, uh, in our study groups and throughout literature of these two messiahs and the roles that they play, having spent, you know, 20, 25 years thinking 
there's one and he you know he he did away with all of the rabbinic teaching he did away with all of the, the the hard work and put it all into a simple faith it is difficult to sit there and think you know if you you know you you've been you've been conditioned to think that way so long and the other thing too uh james you 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 bring up uh, a word a lot concealment and that concealment within the New Testament. So uh, I think what a lot of Christians and what I, I learned specifically was just how different of a set of books that what they call the New Testament really is compared to what it's taught in the seminary, how it's taught from, from the pulpit, and then how it's taught through Sunday school, so on and so on. And mm-hmm. The concept of concealment and and, uh, and 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 revelation are so deep within that group of writings that I think if many Christians could just tap the knowledge of how that's set up, mm-hmm. and you know, we try to touch on it, and we will continue to try to touch on it, they'll understand that books like Revelation and and others that speak at different different levels of that revelation or you know of of the understanding the concealment part it is just absolutely mind-boggling if you've been in that bubble for so long and it just you know i encourage listeners out there that when you hear these uh concepts that we talk about and you hear these ideas please please there is not a question you can't put in the comment section that we would not appreciate and that should not be heard so if there's something that you know you struggle with there then just please please ask that question and we'd be more than glad to try to open that up a little bit further but i'm sorry go ahead Um, yeah man so just to say a couple more things about how fascinating this stuff is about the two messiahs and and how inter interconnected is the life of of yeshua to this, 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 this secret, secret personage of the Messiah, son of Joseph, um, as James is pointing out, there's various times that Jesus is called in the Gospels, Yeshua, son of Joseph. Isn't this the carpenter's son, Joseph's son? Is said like this, okay, plenty of times, a few times. Yeah. Um, not only this, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 just like that. You know, it, it, they don't say. Uh, supposed son of, they don't say none of that they say the son of joseph after um, reading that passage in isaiah in the synagogue right so like the, the new testament authors are they know what they're doing when they're weaving these together yes yep. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. that's oh, a good man. point so, amazing and then um yeah, there's other characteristics that remember these things were codified almost 200 years after the situation of the New Testament. So it wasn't like uh, the New Testament was just trying to make this slip up because they knew it. I mean, if it did know it, but it knew it because of the oral tradition. But the oral tradition wasn't codified until about 200 years later. Mm-hmm. This is what's so amazing about the New mm-hmm. Testament. Mm-hmm. Um, so in, in the in the writings of, of Mashiach ben Yosef, of the Messiah son of Joseph, it is taught in the Talmud. Um, doesn't come to mind right now exactly. It's, it's, it's Sukkah. It, it's it's in Tractate Sukkah. 52, it talks about the 52, yes. In, in Tractate Sukkah, uh, Sukkah 50, 52a, I want to say. It says that it quotes the same passage that the New Testament quotes about Yeshua when he's crucified. And Zechariah 12.10, that he shall be pierced and everyone shall look upon him, Right. It, it says that this will be fulfilled in the Talmud. It says it will be fulfilled by Mashiach ben Yosef. Okay, it is, it is, this is the same thing this says in the New Testament about Yeshua. And that Messiah, the son of Joseph, he's so special, so amazing. Um, there's Midrashim, these stories that is told about the Messiah, these old oral traditions that the patriarchs stand up in the heavens and they, 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 they say, they tell the Messiah, son of Joseph, you are greater than us because you have been able, you have suffered for, for, the, for the Jewish people, suffered horribly, horrible torments. And, and, and you know, and, and it shows all the patriarchs, they, they, they tip their crowns and they praise God, you know, because 
of this great, this great um, God sent agent that has been sent on their behalf to help them. Right. Um, the Messiah is supposed to suffer and he will be an atonement for the Jewish people. Um, he, this is interesting. The Messiah son of Joseph, this, Joseph, that's why he's called that. Like James said, he patterns Joseph Hatzadik, Joseph of, of, of Egypt, uh, Jacob's son, the one who went to Egypt. So the rabbis say that one of the things, one of the main missions of the Messiah son of Joseph is that he will combat and fight against the idolatrous nations. Very much how, in a very concealed way, how Joseph went into Egypt and prepared a way, even though the even though his own brothers didn't know who he was, yep. as as Genesis says, they didn't know who he was, but Joseph knew who they were, right? Um, and so he kind of prepares the way in a safety haven so that his his family can come into Egypt and get spared through the the famine that was in throughout the entire world there. And and what is what is Joseph here? In Egypt, he is looked upon as almost as a god, as a god. That he's looked upon as a god. He is the viceroy of Pharaoh. Yeah. The, the only one higher than him is Pharaoh. He runs everything through his wisdom, right? Um, and so the Messiah, son of Joseph, he has the same pattern that he that he that he goes. He's lost. He goes into the Gentile nations, and he's going to be connected with them. It's just interesting. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> it's just very interesting that this is the way that things have played out in the writings of these holy oral traditions. And so, man, I wanted to say that so you got so that our listeners can have a little bit more details about this concept, which is amazing. Hmm. So this really does tie into what I want to cover briefly: the concept of concealment, um, because when people start to look at the way God has always done things. Concealment is the start, right? All of creation came from Tohu, right? Light came from darkness. Um, revelation comes from concealment. Those yep. who are in darkness have seen a great light. Um, the same pattern is applied to Moses. The Jewish people didn't know who this guy was. He looked like right. an Egyptian. And yep. they didn't want anything to do with it. The same with Joseph. The same with David. This guy's not Jewish, right? And he even came from Philistia before he came back. He had to go into the nation, the enemy, yep. Philistia, and yep. he comes back. Esther, Esther's concealed, right? Um, her name means concealed. Yet a, a, a global kind of redemption comes through her revelation at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, the Torah is given, right? Everything comes from concealment because God yep. says to the people at one point, in Deuteronomy, I didn't give you eyes to see or ears to hear. So we know that all things are, are veiled. And Paul says this right now, for the sake of the Gentiles, the people of Israel have been given a partial blindness. It's not mm -hmm. a total blindness. It's not, a, he says it himself. It's not a total blindness. They, what do they have? They have the oracles. They have the, the, the writings of, of God, right? Oh, they, wow. still have, <laughs> they still have what is necessary I'm going to say it. This is going to trigger some people, but we did an episode on atonement. They still have what's necessary for salvation in the yep. Jewish definition of salvation. They yep. don't. Yep. Apparently Hashem didn't feel <clears throat> that they needed, or it would even be good for the world if Yeshua remained in the Jewish community. Incredible. Incredible. Wow. And wow. because it would never, the message would never have spread out. Now, unfortunately it went the way that it did. Um, the world is in exile. And when the Jewish people are in exile, the whole world's in exile. So yep. the the Jewish people were probably, I mean, I can I can brainstorm a bunch of reasons, one of which being if the Jewish people had become believers or followers, they would be out of the Jewish community into a church where they wouldn't be keeping the Torah and the Torah would be abandoned. Wow. But so through the wisdom of Hashem, he realized. There are two tracks here to get this world on course. Wow. One is the Jewish people have to continue in the covenant. And I don't need them over here. The Gentiles have to learn the basis of what monotheism is. And it's going to do its own thing. And yes, it's going to get messy. But that's how and it is. And it's all constant. It's all, and let me ask you a question, James. As Paul says, the Jews, the Jews already have the covenants. They have the Torah. They have all these, these, uh, 
these agents, not agents, these uh, tools of redemption. They have them. They have all these tools of redemption. The nations are the ones that are without any tool. And yep. is it fair to say that in Yeshua, all those little things, the Torah, the covenants are kind of concentrated in him and have been sent out into the nation world who was in darkness and without God? Yeah, for sure. I think that wow. there is there is no other Jew who has spread the message of God so widely. That's that that's not even, argue, no one can argue that. Um, and in terms of, I'll give you another person in the, in the vein of Mashiach ben Yosef, um, Einstein, right? Think of these other Jews who radically changed the way the world views cosmology, science, physics. Now physics is tracking very close to what the theists and the mystics have been saying for a long time. Yes, so God yes. is God is moving the Jewish people because that's their job. Their job is to spread the, the message of God, to spread the light of the Torah. He's moving them in ways that we just don't see it because we're so used to it, like you said in the very beginning, right? Coming a certain way, the way that we believe it's going to happen. And we're missing it all around us. Um, all of that to say, it's all moving forward. And God is concealing, as he's always done, those who needed to know and those who he's revealing to those who need to know. And I'm going to give you a passage here. I encourage everyone who's listening, take time and read the Clement homilies. You can find them on what a website called Bible Hub. They have all these um, Catholic and Protestant in, in these ancient writings. The Catholic library still holds it because Clement was a pope, I think, or a saint or something. I think he was a pope. Um, Clement was a Jew. He was converted by Peter from a Gentile to a Jew. He was a relative of one of the Roman emperors. And it was a big slap in the face when he converted out of what was almost like a, a line of deity in the Greek Greco Roman worldview to the people of Israel. Yep. So the Clement homilies read like the book of Acts and Peter and Clement are going around and it's the new Testament is the Gentile perspective of the message in, in the Roman empire. It doesn't really do a lot other than the book of Hebrews. It doesn't do a lot for what is going on in the Jewish world. The Clement homilies cover that. It's a compilation later, but it's interesting. All right, all that to say, <clears throat> homily eight, chapter six. It's a quick read. Peter says the following, and I'm going to try to paraphrase this where I can. Jesus is concealed from the Jews who have taken Moses as their teacher. And Moses hmm. is hidden from the Gentiles who have believed Jesus for there being one teaching by both of them. So wow. these guys are both teaching the same thing, apparently. God yeah. accepts those who believe, either of them, believing wow. a teacher for the sake of doing the things spoken by God. So why, why are these teachers sent? Because it spreads the word of God. And Beautiful. he says this, wow. God himself has concealed a teacher from some as foreknowing what they ought to do and has revealed him to others who are ignorant of what they ought to do. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is Peter saying this, um, explaining this, this teaching. Um, it goes on in chapter 7. Peter said, Neither, therefore, the Hebrews condemned on account of their ignorance of Jesus, by reason of him, God, who concealed him from them. If doing the things commanded by Moses, they don't hate Jesus, whom they don't know. So he's saying, by keeping the Torah, they're respecting Yeshua. Right? Wow. It goes on. <laughs> if you're upholding the Torah and both are teaching the Torah, what is their what's left right you're doing they're both of them are doing job so it says i heard a, i heard a, i heard a pastor i'm sorry to cut you off i heard a pastor say that exact same quote he said the only people throughout history who have kept the teachings of jesus have been the rabbis this is a quote by a pastor that was amazing yeah mm -hmm. and that's a very humble and it just shows the sign of the time that when <clears throat> peter goes on and says neither are the gentiles condemned who don't know moses on account of God having concealed him from them, provided that they do the things spoken by Jesus and don't hate Moses, i.e. the Torah, who they don't know. Wow. And it goes on and on. <laughs> this is, I recommend, again, homily 8, chapter 5, 6, and 7. But there's the message right there. Yeah, Both man. of these are to teach different people different things, different roads to the Torah. Now, mm. redemption <laughs> happens when Mashiach ben David comes. We have not been redeemed yet. The world around us is evidence of that. Um, I know that there's a denomination of Christianity that thinks that 
we're in the messianic era. I think that 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 ideology has to be fading with every passing day in yeah. the time that we're in now. But and I haven't met too many of them anymore because I think the last two years have kind of shattered a lot of that. All that to say, the the Christians in the world who are waking up to this, you want to know how you can help the Jewish people, right? This goes back to the the first question, which we didn't address. Do they need Jesus? Messiah can do his work whether they recognize, and I'm just going higher now. Exactly. Any Messiah, any Messiah, Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Jesus, can do the work, and people don't have to see all of the evidence of it, right? Mm. The work can be done, but especially Mashiach ben Yosef. He can work in concealment, and it's God who's doing the concealing. So if people want to know how do we help them, or how do we help the Jews, or how can we be better people against Torah, I would say teach every Jewish person you know, encourage them, if they're not already doing it, do mitzvot, understand the Torah, understand the covenant, understand that's their role. Don't convert yeah. them into churches. Don't pull them away from the Torah. The world is where it is because that's been happening for far too long. And Messianic yeah. Jews do the same. If you're in a Messianic synagogue and you are a Jew, you need to learn the pathways of the Torah. You need to start doing mitzvot. These are the things that Yeshua taught these are the things that the rabbis have taught. This is what Moses taught. This is the plan that we got off track of, and we need to get back on that. Wow. Amazing. Mm. Amazing. That was a lot, man. I, those Clement homilies, those, that passage was huge, huge. And it, and, and, and it would, uh, we would do well, again, to listen to that type of humility and, and, and those vital, vital teachings that it's exactly how I had seen it without knowing that source uh, in my life, you know, being around the Jewish community amongst the rabbis for about 15 years now. And the only thing that I have found there, right, amongst the Jewish people who don't know Yeshua is I have found Yeshua. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have found all the same concepts that I have learned uh, in the New Testament and in, in, the, in, the, in the writings of the apostles. A bunch of Jewish concepts, a bunch of Jewish things. Everything in there is a uh, part of the Torah. Mm -hmm. Everything that they're doing there is dealing with repentance, dealing with keeping the commandments, dealing with, uh, you know, doing good deeds towards your neighbor, loving, loving God with all your heart and love your fellow neighbor. You know, these things are encapsulated there in the writings, of, in, in the words of Jesus. And mm -hmm. where is Jesus? Uh, uh, where is he standing on? He's standing on the foundation, which is the Torah, mm -hmm. which is Moses. This is, this is where he's at. And there's no way to truly ever understand who he is if not brought back into his into his correct context. Maybe. And man, this this uh this is this is just mind boggling. This is just shocking. Those those sources, James. I mean, that's just, just incredible. That if Christians and Messianics could understand that, uh, all of us, all, all the Gentile nations could understand that. That um, you know, this concealment it seems to be fading away for a lot of people there's cracks in in in, yep. in 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 the glass and, and these things as we draw near and near uh to the redemption as as for sure we all can kind of sort of feel that at the end of the road i'll, I'll say this story that i heard one day um it's a, it's a very very popular story there's a pastor uh some type of reverend or priest or something a christian priest pastor he comes up to an Orthodox Jew, I guess they're friends, they live in the old city of Jerusalem, and, and he tells his, 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 his rabbi friend, he tells him, you know, what are you going to do? What, what will you do when the Messiah comes and he's Jesus? And, uh, and the rabbi kind of like smiles, and he tells him, what are you going to do <laughs> when Jesus comes and he, when he returns and he's an Orthodox Jew? That is just... It's just amazing because that is the truth of the matter right there. And it's something that I don't think the Christian world has ever thought about that. I mean, I think if he, if he came right now and he would happen to be thirsty and he needed a cup of water and Jesus had to pass by a church, they would look at him um, and never know who he is. I think they're expecting something else, uh, something else that has been drawn in <clears throat> Christian art and Christian mind, you know, and uh, I think that they would try to read them the Roman pathway, the Roman road of salvation, 
I, I honestly do think they would hand him a tract and they would try to tell him, you know, do you know that, do you know that your Messiah is Jewish? I mean, he came from your tribesmen. They could be talking right to him and never even know. And you know what's um, funny right, with that? The name right, Jesus. I was going to say. Go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, James. Real quick. The name Jesus is only about 500 years old. He probably would have no idea who they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, True. there would be no. <laughs> yeah. Who, what is this? Um, go ahead, yeah. Mitch. I'm sorry. No. And just to piggyback off of, Ray, what you said, um, that the, the Messiah that Jesus came back, he came back and he stood there and he looked there, there would be no equation to what there, there's nothing that he could equate to him, his work, his, his life, you know, his teachings, all of that, everything else is what has been taught down the line and has gone consistently less less more water down further away from it um they yeah, still man. use the, they still use the word messiah within the within the four walls of most churches but it's the messiah that has been stolen you know and i mean this literally the messiah that was stolen from who he truly was rebuilt <laughs> Yeah, rebuild yeah, yeah, yeah. with a whole different foundation and then cut loose and but each time he each time he's been cut loose into a new generation they've added to him or taken away from him and it is a it is a mess and so if he did come Definitely. back it would be just absolute and it's kind of like you know what james said i don't it, what 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 is he going to see what is he going to say what is he going to do and Church, church theology, Christian theology has literally just sliced, diced, cut, maneuvered, and created. You want to talk about idolatry? Hmm. Wow. I mean, I mean, man, listen, if we have any insight into what would Jesus do, okay? And then that's a big slogan in the Christian world. What would Jesus do? Um, think about what he did. In a, in a place that is considered very, very holy, right? Uh, he saw a lot of uh, hypocrisy in his day around the temple courts and what was being done uh, with people who were to get animal sacrifices to go and, and then they would, you know, they would pay for an animal or they would come and they would, you know, get their animals inspected, whatever. And this happened at a place that is known in, in, in the Gospels as the money changers. If everyone is familiar with what happened there and what Jesus actually did, Jesus came in the spirit, the spirit and likeness of a prophet. Hmm. And he says that he turned is one of one of the most uh, one of his greatest uh, outbursts of rebukes upon the religious establishment of that time. He didn't take that. Um, he, he was just like a prophet. This is the kind of things that the prophets would do. And mm -hmm. he flipped all the money changers. And he saw this as a, people were missing the point. Mm -hmm. What was supposed to be happening, right? And just imagine <laughs> if people who carry his banner, if it could be explained to him, yo, these are the people who say they're your followers. These mm -hmm. are the people who are say your disciples. Can you imagine if he flipped over the money changers in, in Jerusalem, what would he do? To a church and its theology, wow. I could not. I could. I could not. I could not even imagine. I could not even imagine. And and, and sad to say, I mean, if, if if no one told the Christians who this person really was, I would say that the people would think that this is the Antichrist who was flipping out. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to say this. I, I believe he'd be very angry over idolatry as it's being presented today but there's hope of course and, of course and there's hope. hope when people begin to listen to truths they begin to do a little bit of homework they begin to use the mind that god gave them they began to ask questions about those gray areas these are the things that we did these are things that lit us up when we began to make steps we get turned on to 
to people like James, who, you know, has an amazing ability to, to see, you know, both sides. But, but this stuff is becoming more and more available. And there is hope that mm -hmm. and it's like you said, you, you're not going to, you don't have to cut an arm off to begin to understand and to begin to see the truth and to be, and begin to see that you are in a good place. You are oh, in a good place with a rabbi that, that can be that, you know, that one. And it, 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 you know, but a lot of times, sadly, within those those walls, it's one or the other. And it's, you know, we're it, you're not, there's nothing else that can be said about it, or you're no longer welcome within these four walls. And that's fine. There are a lot of people that are coming out of those four walls. There are a lot of people that are coming out in the beginning to seek toward Judaism, uh, understanding just where Yeshua walks. And understanding just what he teaches and understanding the concepts that we are beginning to unfold here a little bit. And so um, there is hope. Christianity yeah. itself, and, and James has talked about this, Christianity itself is a vehicle that God has used to bring yes. the knowledge of the one true God. Yes. In, mm -hmm. in all of its in all of its minor in its <clears throat> errors and all that good stuff, it was the it was the agency that God chose to bring the message of the one true God to the world and yes. bring myriads, myriads of Gentiles to know the one true God. I mean, yes. it's incredible. And this in itself, listen, guys, Christianity is a vehicle, is, is a process of the Mashiach ben Yosef, of the Messiah ben Yosef. Yeah. And the Messiah is not just a person. It is a force. It is a movement. And Christianity, it is a movement of the Messiah ben Yosef. Yes. With all of its errors, people think that, that when God uses things, uh, especially if you were to use the Messiah, that things are supposed to be without error, mm -hmm. divinely inspired, no mistakes. That is just not true. That's fairy tale. That's not the way that it works in the real world. It's there, but it's all concealed. And in our day, the hope is that a lot of people are waking up to the truth yep. and we're beginning to reconcile these lost, these the, 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 the lost brother. Uh, Yeshua, the wandering Jew, um, who who no one really no one really understood. He's been taken out of context, misunderstood. Uh, he's he's Joseph in Egypt, and however Egyptians view Joseph, but in reality, though he's dressed in Egyptian garb, who is he? He is the son of Yaakov, the son of Jacob, mm. and brother to the tribesmen. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Who's, right. whose religion whose religion is Judaism he's, he's one of the Hebrews yeah wonderful the last thing I'll say is that Judaism has never really so the problem for me is a little bit different um, the sages never really had a problem with the Gentiles having other gods right as long as the God of Israel was the highest they weren't Gentiles weren't held to the same standards that Jews were and the apostles actually are the ones who set a higher bar for the followers of, of Yeshua. They're the ones who actually ascribed more, made a, a heavier burden for them, um, or, or more fences, you, if you will. But the problem I've had with, with the way the church still acts today in a lot of places is when you take Jews out of their covenantal responsibilities, it costs the world. It costs them yes. and it costs everybody. And I think that's what that's what Yeshua, if he came back, would be frustrated by. Because that yes. is that is a that has a global impact. Hashem mm -hmm. chose a people group to be that beacon of light. <clears throat> and when you slowly, slowly take the each little light bulb out of that that beacon, what do you have at the end? If you get your way, there's no people group anymore. Right. So my I encourage everybody, the people who have kind of woken up, two things. Number one, if you know Jews who are not religious or whatever, encourage them. For me, what really kind of hit the, the switch for me, actually a Christian, um, a Christian who I met briefly, said, you're Jewish, you should really look into that. And it never left my mind. It was like Hashem had sent that message through him. And I looked into it. And I'm going to be looking into it you know, um, for the rest of my life. 
because it's something ignited. The other thing I would say, it's really challenging leaving a church. I know we've done it and I know people who have done it and it's really hard to find community. So if a church is where you are, then, then be there, right? Yeah. And be there and you have conversations, do a study group, pull people together. I know many people back when I lived in Maryland, years ago, we started a Torah club, one of those um, FFOZ, First Fruits of Zion. You don't have to start one. You can just go on their map and find one near you, attend it, see what it's like. Maybe there'll be people there who have the same conclusions that you've had, and you'll start to have a little bit of community because you can't do it alone. It's really, yep. really challenging to yep. do that alone. It's really challenging to have these ideas and not have a place to mm. vet them and, yep. and challenge them. So if you do find yourself in, you know, in this space of, wow, I've just woken up to a whole new reality. Things are never going back the way they were. Don't panic. You're not in sin every Sunday when you go back to church. I mean, it, there's a process. It's going to take you a while. Um, yes. Find community, find friends, find people online. There are tons of Facebook groups. I'm sure you guys could have yep. links to. Um, find Ray and find Mitch on Facebook. There's a lot you can do. People are waking up. Keep studying. And, um, you know, we're here. So if you have questions, keep throwing them at us. Excellent job. Excellent job, Ray. Do you have anything you want to add before we uh, begin? No, to that's back it. Up from no. This? no, we covered it good. Guys. Fantastic. Don't find me on Facebook because I'm a heretic. Listen, <laughs> <clears throat> I want to say um, fantastic job tonight. A lot of great thoughts to continue to unwrap. I can't encourage listeners enough. Don't stop at the end of this video. Do not stop there. This should be a beginning point. Each of these videos or segments or whatever you want to call them that we do, the worst thing you can do is stop at the end of it and let that be the tell all. Continue, continue to, to talk, research. As James said, look for opportunities to pull resources into your world. Um, it is lonely if you do it outside the four walls of the church because community is important to people. Yep. Um, yep. And, and, it, and it's crucial to people. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the vehicle is out there. The vehicle is, is, is running well. It just is now time for a new driver. And with that new driver, he knows how to upkeep the vehicle and have it continue to move with the original engine and spread what's being spread. With that, I want to say before I do close this down, James, the name of your book is? Into the Orchard. It's on Into Amazon. the Orchard. And hit it up on Amazon. It's a fantastic read. It's not a long read. It's uh, nice. it, it's well organized. It's It brings a lot of the concepts and stuff that you hear about here. It brings it into a really nice reading pattern. Check it out. We also put up James's uh, um, website. I tried to include that in the comment section. With this episode, I will include another video <clears throat> from FFOZ that will uh, give you something else to look at. And and they do a little bit more of a polished production. And so uh, you'll get an opportunity to check that out as well. I think we're going to wrap it up because it's well past my bedtime. Okay. I'm not <laughs> as young as Ray and James. I got to get some of that sleep in. So thank you. If you've listened to us tonight, um, again, blessings to you, your families, and to those that you turn on to our episodes and don't be afraid to comment in the comment sections. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode of rethinking faith. You guys take care.